بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما بعد فعن وابسة بن معبد رضي الله عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال له جئت تسألني عن البر والإثم فقال نعم فجمع جمع أنامله فجعل ينكت بهن في صدري ويقول يا وابسة استفت قلبك واستفت نفسك ثلاث مرات البر ما اطمأنت إليه النفس والإثم ما حاك في النفس وتردد في الصدر وإن افتاك الناس وأفتوك رواه أحمد الحمد لله brothers and sisters we are continuing with the prophetic principles for life and as we mentioned previously the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam our deen our quran our way of life is not just something for an unknown and far away hereafter as some people think but if we truly have deen in our lives this deen will perfect every aspect of our lives our public and our private our internal and our external our mental our spiritual, our physical. All of this is what deen came to perfect. It came to perfect humanity. It came to make insan kamil. As the Prophet ﷺ mentions, الأخلاق, I was sent to perfect good character. I was sent to make human beings to the, as perfect as they can be. No human being is perfect. But if there's any level which a human being can reach some you know status of goodness and some status of perfection what is that it is that when we completely follow the deen in all aspects of our life not in just what you know our you know what we believe to be la ilaha illa muhammad rasulullah are you a muslim yes check it's just like a check that we put in a box if that's what islam is in our understanding, there was just a, it's just a box that, that, that box that we check, you know. Are you Muslim? Check, yes, you know. So the reality of it is, is that this brings everything in our life in order. And when there is an imbalance, as we mentioned in the previous ahadith, what did we mention in the previous ahadith? We saw a person who was praying all night and fasting all day, but there was an imbalance. There was an imbalance. He was, he was perfected spiritually. But in the common everyday, pub, his, his public life, his family life, you see, that was being affected. He had, was not perfected. So, you know, when we think about religion or we think about Islam or we think about religious practice, we think about a person maybe sitting in that corner of a masjid or remembering Allah all the time or reciting Quran, fasting all day, praying all night. He's perfect, right? Wrong. He has, not, he has not taken into consideration his family responsibilities. You know, one great scholar just recently, he said something that really touched my heart. It really opened my eyes. He says, one of the reasons why we as Muslims and non-Muslims, they are not ready to accept Islam and not ready to practice Islam is because we haven't understood Islam. We have not properly understood it. We think, in our minds, we've created a notion. What notion? By our experiences, by our observations, by culture. We have not studied it. We have not read the life of the Prophet. We have not studied the quran -i kareem We have not seen this Islam embodied in the most perfect form. Otherwise, in our minds, one person is saying, you know, I don't want to practice Islam. It's just too much for me. It's too much for you. Here is an example of the Prophet where he's telling a companion, pray less, and fast less, and be, to give your attention to your family. Why are you not focused on your wife? Why are you not focused on your private matters and your own personal matters? Balancing him. See, that person who thought that I don't want to be a full proper Muslim because it's going to make me leave my family. He's actually have not understood Islam. The, prof, the Islam of Muhammad Sallallahu Not the Islam of some, maybe some people that we see or that we observe or this, this notion we have in our mind. We create an image, right? Because this was the Sahaba or this was the Prophet. Whereas we don't really know what balance the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has come with. 
So this statement of this scholar was, it really touched me. It really opened my mind that we have not properly understood it. And non-Muslims have also probably not understood it and that's why we're afraid of it. That's why we're intimidated. And we see people that are even, you know, they have movements. They have properly not understood it. They hold one aspect of it and they forget about all the other aspects of it. And the example of this is what Maulana Rumi rahmatullahi in the Mathnawi. He tells a story that one time they brought the elephant from India to Arabia. In Arabia, they never seen elephant. You know? Alam tara kaifa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al fil. The fil was not brought to Makkah. You know, it didn't grow there. They brought it from very far away. The king of Persia, Abraha, who was connected with the Persian Empire, he brought it from that side. He brought it from the Persian Empire to attack the Kaaba. Otherwise, they have never seen elephants before. When they first saw the elephants, they're like, what are these dinosaurs? You know, what are these creatures? So the story goes is that they brought this elephant to Arabia, but they didn't show anybody. They put it in a big dark room. And they had everybody go inside this room and say, go and see and tell us when you come out, what is this elephant? So they sent one person and he grabbed the leg, he came out, he said, so what's an elephant? He said, it's a pillar. It's a pillar. They brought this pillar from India. Must be an architectural wonder. So then a next person go, comes inside and he grabs, you know, the snout and he said, you know, this is a water hose. The next person goes in and he grabs the ear of the elephant. He said, what is the elephant? He comes out and he says, it's a fan. And then they send a little boy with a light, small light, little child, and he lights with the candle. He looks at the elephant and he says, oh, no, it's not a pillar. It's not a, you know, uh, hose. You know, it's not a uh, fan. It's, it's a very, you know, it's a very complex animal, very strange and unusual. It has all different parts. It's very large, it's very amazing, it's very profound. Similarly, my dear brothers and sisters, when we, in our understanding of Islam, we see one aspect of it. Some people see political aspect of it. They say Islam is politics. Another person holds on to the spirituality. They say Islam is spirituality and just worshiping God day and night. Another person will grab another aspect of it and says, you know, Islam is jihad fi sabilillah. That's all it is. There's nothing else. That's the only way. So each person, another person holds on and saying, Islam is tabligh, da'wat and tabligh. There's no, no, nothing else in Islam. Subhanallah. That's right. Like the elephant is a snout and the elephant is an is a ear and the elephant is legs and the elephant is a body. The elephant is all those things, but not one thing does not make the elephant. Similarly, not one aspect makes up Islam. You hold on to that one thing, you said, all of Islam is this, this is not right. Islam is so dynamic. It's so complex. It is so beautiful. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. This day I have perfected for you your religion. Perfect. Allah says this is kamil deen. It's kamil, complete, perfect way of life. Every aspect, private and public, social and, you know, uh, private sector, politics and spirituality, family life and, you know, uh, public life. Every single aspect, spirituality and, you know, academia and every aspect of it, Islam covers all of those aspects. So with that being said, when we're talking about these prophetic principles, these are actually lessons from the Prophet ﷺ who's telling us how we perfect our lives, how we attain perfection in our living, that when we're following this, following this deen, these aspects of it should be perfected in our lives. So with that being said, principle number five. Yesterday, what did we speak about? Yesterday we spoke about that we should not follow our impulses. 
We should not make your desire what you are following. And in this one, that the Prophet ﷺ narrates, Wabisat ibn Ma'bad came to the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. And when he came, this is one of the miracles of the Prophet. He wanted to accept Islam. So he came to the Prophet and the Prophet ﷺ immediately without him speaking yet, he said, Jita, Tas'alu anil birri wal ithm. You have come to ask about goodness and sin. You have come to ask about righteousness and vice. Is that correct? He says, yes, O Messenger of Allah. So then the Prophet ﷺ, he put his fingers together and he put his hand on the chest of this Sahabi, Wabisa. And he says, Ya Wabisa, istafti qalbak wa istafti nafsak. He said, ask your heart and look into your conscience. Ask your heart and look into your conscience. And he said this three times. And then he says, Al-birru matma'annat ilayhi nafs He says, piety is that which the heart feels comfortable. When you do something good, then your heart will feel at ease. وَالْإِثْمُ مَا حَاكَ فِي النَّفْسِ وَتَرَدَّدَ فِي الصَّدْرِ And sin is something that bothers your conscience. It bothers your conscience and it itches you inside. You know that you're doing something wrong. It bothers your conscience. وَإِنْ أَفْتَاكَ النَّاسُ وَأَفْتَوْكَ Even if the people give you fatwa, and even if the people tell you otherwise, if your heart tells you that this is not right, then this is not right. Subhanallah. What a principle of life. Here the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us what? That one of the most important principles of life is listen to your moral compass. Allah put in the heart of everybody a compass. You know a compass? The compass is always facing towards the north. If you flick it, it'll shake, but then it'll come back to the north. Allah Azza wa Jal has programmed us. You know how you program a computer and you have a default page, Google? So the default page of the heart is goodness. To want to do good. Everyone Muslim and non-Muslim is born. Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al-fitra. Every human, be- every human being is born upon the fitra. They have a natural inclination towards the good things. And they have a natural disinclination. They know that this thing is not good and this thing is bad. The Prophet ﷺ is telling us that moral compass that you are born with, you must listen to it. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran, لا أقسم بيوم القيامة ولا أقسم بن نفس اللوامة Allah swears by Yawm al qiyamah because it's something very great. And then Allah Ta'ala says, I swear by nafs al I swear by the self-reproaching conscience that I have instilled inside of you. Yani it is such a great thing that Allah has programmed us with that this conscience is something that it will kill you to make you and bring you back on the right path. So many people commit crimes and they do bad things. And you know what? They're doing all of these bad things, but that moral compass inside their heart eventually brings them back to the right path. This moral compass and this conscience, if we listen to it, you know what's going to happen? It will continuously bring you on the right track. It will continuously bring, bring you on the right path. So many brothers and sisters I know who accepted Islam. Why did they accept Islam? They said, I just felt in my heart that this was not right. I knew that a man could not be God or the son of God. So many people I heard saying this. Their moral compass of tawheed that Allah Ta'ala had put inside them. The, the priest could tell them anything. They said, in my heart, I knew that this was not correct. And I have heard there was a, a friend, we were in school together many years later. He was a famous bully. I saw him after many years. I said, hey man, how you been? I said, you had really bad days, didn't you? He said something to me. It really, it really struck me. I want everyone to listen to what he said. He was a friend, but he used to hang out with the bad crowd. And the bad crowd he used to hang out with, may Allah forgive me, I'll never forget. They used to get together and they used to bully this one kid all the time. When I would see that they were going in that direction, I would just, I would just run, run home. I didn't even want to see it. They would bully this kid who couldn't defend himself. So him, he was a good friend, but when he would, cat, he would gather together with those four or five guys, he would also join in the bullying. And then I asked him, I said, you know, why were you with those guys? 
You were used to do that every single day. You never used to get tired of it. He said, you know what? I felt really, really bad. And my, there was something inside of me telling me that it's wrong. Look at what he says. He said, but I just turned it off. He said, it kept telling me that this is not the right thing to do. But you know what? What I did, he said, that voice was telling me, but I just turned it off and it stopped talking to me. Subhanallah. This was, this was like when we were in college. I, we, were, we were like in elementary and junior high together. And then later on, four or five years later, I saw him in college and I asked him about this. I said, man, you still a bully? He started laughing and he said, nah, man, but you know, I always felt that that was wrong. That wasn't right. He said, and I always heard a voice inside telling me that it's wrong, but I didn't listen to it and I just turned it off. So it stopped talking to me. Subhanallah, this is so powerful because it tells us that this person, he doesn't have any religion. He doesn't believe in God, but there is that nafs al-lawama inside of him. So many soldiers come back from overseas and they come back with PTSD. What do they have PTSD for? They're fighting for the, you know, liberty and justice, right? This is what, what's happening, right? When they come back, they're suffering from PTSD. It's because that moral conscience will not allow a person, if he's committed anything that is wrong, for him to live comfortably. And there is something that there's only one solution to that that will remove all the PTSD. And you know what that is? That is tawbah. That is repentance. That is ruju ila Allah. Ya Allah, tubtu ilayka. Oh Allah, forgive me for the sins that I have committed. And that is the function. Why Allah has put inside of us that nafs al-lawama? Because the nafs al-lawama makes us turn back to what? Repentance. And many of them, some of my, our friends who were, you know, involved in certain things, they said that, you know, the only thing that removed that grief and that depression and that PTSD was when we made tawbah and we asked Allah Ta'ala's forgiveness, then it was, it completely went away. This is why Allah Ta'ala has placed this inside of us. Also in our relationships, brothers and sisters. Sometimes we don't know, is this the right thing to do or is it the wrong thing to do? You have, you know, family or group of people, they're all, you know, joined together and they're doing the wrong thing. Just like this young man who was part of the bully, the team with the bullies. Right? Sometimes we are also, we're with the wrong crowd and in our mind and in our heart, we know that this is wrong. We should not be doing this because my conscience says this is not the right thing to do. You know when it's not the right thing to do? Then leave that. Never ever allow yourself to be in something where your heart and your moral conscience is telling you opposite of that. This is such a beautiful advice of the Prophet ﷺ because if we live by it, you know what happens? We will always be kept on the straight path. You don't ever need a mufti with you. You don't ever need a mufti. Sometimes the biggest, the best mufti is the mufti of your conscience. This is not the correct thing. This is not the right thing to do. And, you know, you might be, you know, you might not have somebody to ask. But this is the, the, the rule that the Prophet ﷺ taught us. That what? When you have a question, see within your heart. Does it bother you? Does it make you feel uncomfortable? Then know that whatever bothers you, it makes you feel uncomfortable. And in another hadith, it says, وَكَرِهْتَ أَنْ يَطَّلِعَ عَلَيْهِ النَّاسِ That you don't want people to hear about that you did that. Then you know what? Avoid that. Sometimes we're having conversations with the wrong person. We're having a conversation with somebody of the you know, opposite gender. And you say, oh, it's no big deal. But would you want, the person, would you want that girl's father to know about that? Would you want somebody else to, for, for you to have that, that you're having that conversation? Okay, then, this, then you understand that this is inappropriate then. So these are things as usuls and as principles in our life that if we remember, if we follow that moral compass, that moral compass and that conscience will lead you to perfection. Otherwise, like that young man said, if you just turn it off, you know what's going to happen? It's not going to, it's going to stop talking to you. And when it stops talking to you, then there's another thing that will take over. And that's nafs ammara There's that as well. You have the nafs lawama that's constantly telling you, this is not good. This is not right. This way, this, what you said is not good. Sometimes we'll say something and then later on we'll be like, I shouldn't have said that. That was so bad. That is nafs lawama 
That is the self-blaming and reproaching nafs. That's a blessing of Allah. Guilt is a blessing of Allah. Telling you that this is not the right thing. When it tells you it's not the right, not the right thing, listen to it. The more you listen to it, it will fine-tune you. It will take you to perfection. Allah has placed the shaykh inside of you. Allah has placed the guide inside of you. And the more you listen to it, the more it will perfect you, the more it will guide you. And the more you tune it down and turn it off, it will abandon you. And then you know what? Who will take over? nafs ammara will take over. nafs ammara is then the loud, obnoxious commander of sin who commands you to do sin. Yeah, do it. It's good. Namanish. Bugo. Don't leave them. Walagam abonamish. You know, then you get this like, you know, that, that provoking nafs pushing you all the time. And you push, it pushes you and you will push others as well. So this is, in a, this is subhanallah, a principle to live by. Listen to your moral compass and your conscience because inshallah it will take you to the right direction. May Allah ta'ala give us tawfiq to understand what has been said. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillah.